The Rise of Prussia, or What is Prussia Anyway? <laughs> the first thing to say about Prussia is that Prussia is one of those things that when you're talking about it, most people don't really know what you're talking about, even if they pretend that they do. For example, if I say Britain, you're normally like, Ooh, I know what that means! And you have a clear image in your mind of what you mean by Britain. Or if I say France, you have a pretty clear idea in your mind of what we mean by France. Or if I say Russia, you have a pretty clear idea in your mind of what we mean by Russia. Or if I say even Austria, you have a pretty clear idea in your mind of what we mean by Austria. But if I say Prussia, you're like, what, dude, what's that? You have some idea that it's in Europe, probably, but your idea is very cloudy. Is it kind of like Russia with a P, or what is it? Well, the first thing to know about Prussia is it's really the name of a region. A region that's not even in modern-day Germany. It's about here, from Danzig, or Gdansk, to basically this bay over here. Um, it's just this region right here. And it's called Prussia because of the Old Prussians, what we call now the Old Prussians, a Balto-Slavic tribe that lived there. We'll talk about that later. However, to talk about the political entity Prussia, we really have to understand that the real thing we're talking about is a thing called Brandenburg Prussia. Ultimately, we're talking about the domains of the Hohenzollern family. And that ends up being not one two, one major place, but two major places. Um, Brandenburg and Prussia. So if you take a look at this map right here, um, you have Brandenburg and you have Prussia. So in order to understand this political entity called, that we now call, or sorry, that, we, that was once called Prussia, we have to talk about Brandenburg, and then we have to talk about Prussia, and then we have to talk about putting them together. The March of Brandenburg. What was that? The first question we have to answer in talking about the March of Brandenburg is, what is a march? Well, strangely enough, the word march has nothing to do with marching as in walking. It actually comes from the German word mark, which means a mark. Um, in other words, a border, something to mark where your land is. Mark, border, or boundary. Uh, therefore, um, a march, the idea of a march is basically a border land, a territory that was on the border of a kingdom or an empire or what have you. Uh, because of that, a person who took charge of a mark was often called a Markgraf in German. Uh, let me write that down here. A Markgraf which in German means a count, um, basically, of a mark, or a march. This has become the English word margrave, which is also why you sometimes hear not the march of Brandenburg, but the margraviate of Brandenburg. A person who runs a march is called a margrave, and therefore a march is sometimes called a margraviate. Um, it actually corresponds in the French Francophonic countries to a marquis. Uh, if you've ever heard of the marquee, of a marquee, a marquee basically covers the same word. Now, so much for the word. The co the uh, idea goes back to the time of Charlemagne. You all, we all have talked about Charlemagne in this course. Um, as you know, Charlemagne had a large Frankish empire. Um, one of his big projects was to try to take Muslim territory in Spain back for the Christians. So he spent a long time fighting in Spain. It turned out to be extremely difficult. Everywhere else, he had pretty fast expansions. He was a very energetic individual and his, uh, had very strong armies, and he was used to basically making fast progress, but he made very slow progress into Spain and eventually only uh, ga gained a very little bit of land that he now had to have defended. So they call that the Spanish March, meaning the Spanish borderland. So the idea goes back to him. Now, you notice in this particular map, his empire, though large, still has not reached the territory of modern-day Brandenburg. Here's the Elbe River, and here's the Oder River. He's not there yet, although I should say that a lot of the Slavs who lived in this area paid tribute to Charlemagne and Aachen. So, um, so there is a lot of tribute in these areas, but he hasn't conquered this, these areas. 
Now, the idea continues later um, as the generations go down. You all remember before we talked about his three grandsons. His three grandsons eventually divided his empire. Um, this was the West Kingdom of the Franks over here. Um, then there's the Holy Roman Empire proper right here, the small sliver in the middle. And then there's the Kingdom of the Eastern Franks, so the Eastern Frankish em uh, Kingdom here, Eastern Frankish Kingdom. They made more progress. You can see they're pushing a little bit further here. But here's the Elbe, still here's the Elbe, and here's the, um, the odor. Let's see, I can't see it right now. Here's the odor right here. Uh, no, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, here's the odor over here. So they're still not quite making it. Brandenburg itself is over here, but they're not there. However, what you do see is they're making some more marches. So here's the Marsch Oriental, which will later become Austria. Um, and then over here is the Marsch de Friol. So this idea of marches, uh, March de Boheme, right here, this idea of marches, borderlands, is still um, gaining uh, traction as they expand to the land of the Wends over here. This is basically, the Wends are kind of the main project during this time. Um, very good. And then eventually, as you know, the empire itself disappears, and you just end up with two kingdoms, the kingdom of the West Franks and the German kingdom of the East Franks. As you might recall, in 962 AD, the Holy Roman Empire made a comeback in the person of Otto I. Otto I had done a lot of great deeds for Christendom, so the Pope rewarded him by renaming him Holy Roman Empire after the Holy Roman Empire had disappeared for about 40 years. Uh, you can see that right here. He's got the symbol of Holy Roman Empire right here, the orb. Um, this is him in a statue at Meissen Cathedral by the Naumburg Master, a statue of him and his wife, St. Adelaide of Italy. Uh, the Naumburg Master was a great sculptor whose name we, whose identity we still do not know that did a lot of churches, uh, 12th century churches, sculptures in Germany. Otto greatly expanded the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he also basically settled the Hungarians. They were attacking a lot, and he got them to settle down in what will become the Kingdom of Hungary. But also he expanded a little bit to the east in that territory of the Wends, the Slavs. Uh, the... Uh, and in doing so, he founded a lot more marches. You see here the March of uh, Meissen. You see right here the March of Moravia. You see right here the North March. And that's the one that's important for us because that North March right there is basically going to be called later the March of Brandenburg. It's very important strategically, so in a sense, it's a high honor to have it. Uh, this North March uh, is going to be the North March equals the Margraviate of Brandenburg. It become, it's get its, its own count and becomes just one more territory you can give to reward various people that have done you service. Um, however, it's also the sandbox of the empire. One thing it suffers from is a lack of natural resources. The ground there is not very fertile and it can only support a small population. It'll all, for a long time, Brandenburg's main problem is it can't produce, it can't hold, it can't contain, support many people. Yeah. The march gains, nevertheless, because of its strategic importance, it uh, remains a very valuable piece of territory. So much so that in the year 1356, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles IV, you can see him right here, his statue at the Charles Bridge in Prague, um, he used Prague as his capital when he was the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, Charles V issued the Golden Bull. You've heard that before. That was the bull that formally established seven electors. It's called the Golden Bull again because of the golden seal that was used to seal it. Um, it established seven electors for the Holy Roman Empire from then on. And you're used to this by now. We've talked about it a lot. But one of those seven Holy Roman electors, these electorates were, was the electorate of Brandenburg. You can see right here, remember, the electorate of Brandenburg, the Margrave of Brandenburg, the Duke of Saxony, the King of Bohemia, the Count Palatine of the Rhine, the Archbishop of Cologne, the Archbishop of Mainz, and the Archbishop of Trier. So you get uh, those established, the seven electors. So it goes from, under the Golden Bull, it goes from being the, the Margraviate of Brandenburg, now passes to become the electorate of Brandenburg. So it's one of those privileged seven territories that bring with it an electorate. Remember, the electorate privilege is more than just being able to elect the Holy Roman Emperor. It also means that you can never alienate territory again. 
That means that if, um, in all the 360 principalities that make up the Holy Roman Empire, these seven will always only absorb. They will never themselves divide. And so you know that that 360 by the time of Napoleon is basically down to about 60. And that's because these seven are the ones that are doing most of the absorbing since they cannot be alienated, they cannot be divided. Um, the, being electorate is more than just being able to elect the Holy Roman Emperor. It gives you a certain preeminence over all other um, territories. The last step in our study of just Brandenburg is what happens to Brandenburg at the Council of Constance, um, which lasted from 1414 to 1418 A.D. A very important council, the council where Jan Hus was burned at the stake, so sorry about that, but it's also the council where the Great Western Schism was ended when uh, the three popes all were somehow... Uh, deprived of their office, and Pope Martin V was elected. The council was mainly led by um, the elected Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund I, who was also the King of Hungary. Now at this council, Sigismund I took the opportunity to reward his trusty servant, the Burgrave of Nuremberg. Um, Nuremberg was, here you can see it right here, was the effective capital of the Holy Roman Empire, Technically, there is no capital of the Holy Roman Empire, but Nuremberg was always a place where the Holy Roman Emperor spent a lot of time, mainly because the Golden Bull also stipulated that the first Reichstag, or Diet, of every Holy Roman Emperor had to be in Nuremberg. And so, Frederick was the Burgrave of Nuremberg, the guy who took care of it in the absence of the Holy Roman Emperor. And in the election of the Holy Roman Emperor of the year 1411, the one that would actually pick Sigismund, uh, Frederick represented Sigismund himself and elected him. This is because Sigismund had a claim to the electorate of Brandenburg itself, but it was a disputed claim, so Sigismund, who was busy in Hungary, asked Frederick to represent him at the election in his name, and Frederick voted for Sigismund. So as a reward, Sigismund now gave Frederick his own electorate of Brandenburg in return, since, uh, since Frederick represented him as elector of Brandenburg at his own election. So now... The reason this is important is because Frederick was from the family of Hohenzollern, and this is how the Hohenzollerns become basically the lords of the, uh, the Margraves of Brandenburg. You can see that right here on this uh, key, this legend of the map on the side here. If you look over here, the house of Hohenzollern has uh, Brandenburg. That set, sets us up now for the Brandenburg half of things. It's now in the possession of the Hohenzollerns, and it will stay that way pretty much until the end of the German Empire. Prussia proper. In talking about Prussia proper, first reminder of where we're talking about, here you, here you can see it again. There it says Prussians on this map. Um, today we normally call these people the Old Prussians, the actual Balto-Slavic tribe. We say Old Prussians to distinguish them from the later inhabitants of the state of Prussia. Um, and as you can see, they basically rule or uh, held um, this bay area right here. Um, just a reminder, here's where Brandenburg will eventually be. This is, of course, a map of Charlemagne's territory, but right now, that area of Brandenburg is in tributary territory. Um, so here's a big question. This word, these Prussians, these old Prussians, are a firmly Balto-Slavic people surrounded by other Slavs. So, of course, the major question we're talking about Prussia is how on earth did a bunch of German speakers, Germanophones, end up in this firmly Slavic area? Um, it's all part of that Drang nach Ost that we talked about, that drive towards the east that sometimes people talk about the German people. The, um, but the main question is, how specifically Prussia, since Prussia is going to be um, of major importance later? Strangely enough, to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the Crusades. Now, if you recall, the Crusades began because... The territory of the Abbasids, which included the Holy Land, was eventually basically taken over, not officially, but basically taken over by a new people called the Seljuk Turks, devout Sunni Muslims who basically defended the Abbasid Caliphate against the, Fat the rival Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt, the Seljuk Turks, who were excellent fighters. One problem with the Seljuk Turks is that they basically took over Jerusalem in 1070 AD and killed a lot of the Christian inhabitants of Jerusalem and also prevented further pilgrimages. Then they also 
uh, whooped the Byzantine Empire in 1071 AD at the Battle of Manzikert, and the Byzantine Empire needed help, and they had no one to go to but the Pope in Rome. So in 1095 AD, Pope Urban II called the Counts of Claremont and basically appealed to the kingdoms of Western Europe to do something about the Seljuk Turks to help the um, their Byzantine brethren in the Far East and also to liberate the Holy Land and make it safe for pilgrims to go there. The problem was that in the meantime, the Fatimids had taken over the Holy Land and they were a lot nicer to the Christians of Jerusalem, but nobody told Europe, and so it was a war against the Seljuk Turks, even though Seljuk Turks no longer had Jerusalem by that point. Nevertheless, um, this started a mass movement. Basically, um, thousands and thousands of people gathered together and made the journey from the kingdoms of Europe um, down to Constantinople, where they stayed for a while and uh, basically enjoyed the hospitality of the Byzantine emperor, and then finally got around to going into Anatolia, and amazingly, one, after several hardships crossing the Anatolia, uh, Anatolia, where a lot of them were slaughtered or died of hunger, thirst, or disease, um, or overheating, eventually made it to Jerusalem. Thus, in 1099 AD, the Christians' armies made it to Jerusalem. You can see them here besieging the city. Here you can see a catapult or a trebuchet, and the various things are all climbing up the ladders. They besieged the city and took it over with great slaughter and massacre. Even they mention this in their Christian sources, not just the Muslim sources that mention this, but the Christian sources mention how much bloodshed there was at the siege of Jerusalem in 1099. Um, you can see one image here. Here's another picture, another contemporary picture. You can see very clearly the Christian soldiers, mostly Normans, mostly Frankish Normans. We talked about Normans, the Viking, the former Vikings that settled in France. Um, here's Peter the Hermit, one of the great leaders of the First Crusade. And here is are your, um, your Muslim warriors, mainly Fatimid uh, Muslims from Egypt, fighting in this particular part of the Crusades. And here is a more contemporary image that gives you an idea of the, uh, the feeling of liberation that the Christians felt. You also notice the crosses. That's going to be a big deal, the crosses that they wear, because uh, the whole reason they're called crusades is because these people would literally take up the cross, and they would uh, do it in, for, in return for an indulgence. This was the original indulgence, by the way. Um, to get an indulgence, you had to actually go on a crusade and fight for the Holy Land. Um, today, you just pray a rosary, but that's what it was originally. Um, they... Uh, now, great, now they got Jerusalem, now it was theoretically safe for pilgrims, but now they had to stay, and staying was the hard part. Eventually, um, in the process of the First Crusade, the Christians established four Latin kingdoms, that's what they're called, the four Latin Crusader kingdoms, the County of Edessa, the Principality of Antioch, which is actually the first one, it was run by the Normans from southern Italy, um, the County of Tripoli, and the Kingdom itself of Jerusalem. Um, one thing I should point out, too, is notice here, Acre, which is going to become one of the major cities in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the major defense for the Christians. Now, settling down these uh, four kingdoms was fine, but then there was a problem with the fact that they're surrounded by enemies. Over here you have the Sunni Great Seljuk Empire. For a while, actually, Christians are relatively safe from this area because the Seljuks do not unite. Their main enemy is going to be the assassins, but we don't have time to talk about that. Um, down here, you have the Fatimid Caliph, the Caliphate, which is zealously Shiite, the enemy of both the Seljuk Turks and the Christians. So you basically have these coastal kingdoms, these small strips, a small strip of land um, uh, of Christians, surrounded by enemies. And as we all know, in that part of the world, peace come does not come very easily in such a situation. There's going to be a lot of strife between these four kingdoms and the area around them. Um, there is some trade, by the way. They do end up having some amicable relations. For example, Venice, Venice and Genoa, as we talked about before, profit much from this because they get to send their ships to supply their Europeans with the things that they're used to, but then they also get to take stuff that the Seljuks have bought all the way from India and China even and bring it back to Europe, and that's how Europe starts to get hooked on spices. Um, Nevertheless, the main thing is there's going to need to be some sort of protection for people because this is dangerous territory. The solution to this problem of defending Christians who were living or visiting the Holy Land in these kingdoms was the rise of the military orders. These were actual religious orders, that is, um, men 
who take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, just like other religious orders, but they added to it the uh, defense of pilgrims. So basically poverty, chastity, and obedience, and the defense of pilgrims. Um, that was the idea originally, um, and it basically maintained that, but the end result was that you had basically these men who were um, became elite fighting forces, really. Um, the most important two, and definitely the best two, were the Knights Templar, Here's their symbol right here, the red cross on a white background, um, which basically imitates the Crusader cross. And they were first. They were founded in the year 1118. Um, we could talk about them more maybe some other time, but they got a very interesting history. The other one was the Knights Hospitaller, which is a white cross on a black background at first, although later, as you can see here, it became a white cross on a red background, but especially with this Maltese cross with the little... Uh, indentations in it right here. That's uh, that's a typical Knights Hospitaller. They were founded actually a little bit earlier in 1113, although they didn't become military until after the Knights Templar figured out this whole military thing. So that's when their hospital was founded. The Knights Templar were so called because they were founded at um, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which the Christians called the Temple of Solomon. Here you see the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Um, you all recognize perhaps the Dome of the Rock. That's what the Christians called the Temple of the Lord. But across from it is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. When the Christians took it over, they called it the Temple of Solomon, and that's where the Knights Templar started. That's why they're called the Knights Templar. The Knights Hospitaller were founded in the Hospital of St. John, which has actually been there for centuries, but they took it over in 1113 AD from the Benedictines. So you have the Knights Hospitaller of St. John and the Knights Templar. They were the two most important. The uh, hospital itself that the Knights of St. John ran is a hospital in two senses. One in the in the way we're used to, that is, it literally was a place to take care of the sick. As a matter of fact, the Knights Hospitaller were also elite doctors for their time, and that's still true. The Knights Hospitaller still exists, but today they're the Knights of Malta, and the Knights of Malta are known for their humanitarian aid in, ver in various parts of the world, and basically trying to bring medical supplies to various parts of the world. They don't fight anymore, even though they still exist. Celia's dad, if you recall, she mentioned that her dad is a Knight of Malta. Um, but the other definition of hospital at this time is literally a place of hospitality, a place where pilgrims can stay when they come to visit the Holy Land. And of course that makes sense that you would want to have defenders because it's literally a place for um, innocent and unprotected pilgrims to stay. So that was kind of the idea of the Knights Hospitaller. This situation worked out fine for a while. Those two orders were enough and the Hospital of St. John was enough. But eventually... German-speaking pilgrims who came to the Holy Land felt that their needs were not being adequately met. So in 1143 AD, um, there was founded the Teutonic Hospital of Jerusalem. Not yet a military order, just a hospital, hospice, so to speak. Um, this hospital, uh, well, the word Teutonic just means German-speaking. It's the same root word as Deutsch, as in Sprechen Sie Deutsch. And according to Tacitus, the Roman author, it comes from the German god Twisto that the ancient Germans used to worship, but you get the idea. If you hear the word Teutonic, that just means German. Uh, and here is a picture right here. Let me just uh, get rid of this real quick. Of the original hospital where it is in today. The, it's ruins in Jerusalem. This is the German-speaking hospital as it is now. Now eventually, these the German hospital had to leave Jerusalem because Saladin eventually comes over and overtakes Jerusalem. Um, the Christians lose Jerusalem itself, but their kingdom doesn't. Basically, the ca the capital of the Christian kingdom goes to Acre. So the uh, the German hospital as well moves to Acre. Here's a picture of Acre. Uh, there, it's a very it's a coastal town, and that works well for the Christians because they can get their much needed supplies from Europe. Um, the Germans are no different. They also the German hospital moves to Acre, and that's where it becomes military. In the year 1198 A.D., um, it becomes the Teutonic Order. Another military order, an order of German-speaking nobles, open to them only, take po vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and also fighting. The difference is that these are all German. Uh, here is their symbol. It's kind of the reverse of the Knights of Malta, the Knights Hospitaller. A black cross on a white background, that's going to designate them. And here's an actual Teutonic Knight um, in his garb. Um, notice the helm. The one thing the Teutonic Knights are known for is their flashy ceremonial helms with usually either horns or even wings on the side. So, Teutonic Order. Unfortunately, the timing was bad. 
The Christian presence and power in the Middle East was waning. This was mostly due to the efforts of Saladin, the Kurdish general who managed to do pretty much the impossible, unite the forces, the Muslim forces of both Syria, Seljuk Turks, and Egypt, the Fatimid Caliphate, thus forming what was called the Ayyubid Sultanate. That was because he was the son of Ayyub, he was Saladin ibn al-Ayyub, and he founded what's called the Ayyubid Dynasty. You can even see it here in German, um, Reich der Ayyubiden, the Ayyubids. Um, Saladin basically uh, won several battles against the Christians, and uh, the Christians would never recover. From then on, the kingdoms gets, got smaller and smaller. They already lost Jerusalem. Thus, the Teutonic Knights wanted another job. They were failing in the Crusades. So Hermann von Salza, um, this is him right here, asked to commute his vow, basically, the vows of the Knights, the Teutonic Knights in general. Remember, Crusaders, uh, crusading involved a vow. It was basically a vow to fight for Christ. But he basically wanted to go to another place, some other place to do a crusade. Um, for instance, there were crusades, by this point, the crusades were a popular thing all over Europe. There were plenty of infidels in Europe to fight. So, for example, there were crusades in Spain to regain um, Spain for Christianity. There were crusades in France against the Albigensians, the Cathars. Um, there were crusades in all various kinds of places, and the Teutonic Knights wanted in on, just wanted to get out of the Holy Land. At first, they were invited by the King of Hungary to come help out over there. So Hermann von Salza brought the Teutonic Knights there in order to fight the Kipchaks at their southeastern border. However, the King of Hungary immediately noticed that the Teutonic Knights seemed to want land. They wanted to actually find a place to settle down and kind of run their own um, fief, so to speak. So he kicked them out. So they really had no place to go. Finally, they turned to the most powerful Holy Roman Emperor in history, Frederick II Hohenstaufen, the height of the Holy Roman Empire. You can even see that right here, how big the Holy Roman Empire was at his time. He's basically got the normal um, Central European area. He's also got Southern Italy. He inherited Southern Italy through his Norman mother. His mother was a Norman. Also the islands, uh, the, uh, the Normans, uh, the Norman Southern Italy um, contained the I also c controlled the islands of the Mediterranean. You can see that basically they've surrounded the Pope. The Pope is still there. You can see this slight purple right here. That's the Papal States. But he was extremely powerful. Um, he gave them, he was also a very strange character. He was called the Stupor Mundi, the wonder of the world. That's mainly because he just, no one had categories for him. He, uh, he was an atheist and uh, was a very impious person in general. You might remember him because he was the one who founded the University of Naples. He granted the Teutonic Knights a place to fight the infidel, um, Prussia, the, uh, to basically go, down, go there, establish themselves there, and try to win over the old Prussians, the Slavonic tribe, Slavic tribe, the Balto Slavic tribe called the old Prussians, and also the Lithuanians, the old Prussians, the Livonians, the Lithuanians, to basically fight against them as a crusade. No, people had tried before, but no one had succeeded in either converting them or in, um, in uh, beating them back. That's where the Teutonic Knights went. Now, interestingly enough, before we move on with that, I should mention that in the year 1291, this, by the way, uh, this all happened in the year 1226. In the year 1291, the Crusades finally ended all together. Um, as you can see right here at the Siege of Acre, so this is down in Acre, um, the Mamluk Sultans of Egypt who had taken over from the Ayyubids, um, attacked Acre, and the knights there made a great last defense, but eventually the Mamluks won, and that was the end of the Crusader presence in the Holy Land. That was in 1291. I bring it up, though, because in this painting you can actually see some Teutonic knights. You see a Teutonic knight right here. You can see their flag right here. You also see some knights hospitaller right here uh, with their later red uh, mantle. Um, they fought bravely, but now they have no place, they're, they're done in the Holy Land. The Teutonic Knights already have another place to go. They can go to, um, Prussia. The Knights, the ha Knights Hospitaller eventually went to Rhodes, as you know, until the 1500s when they were kicked out of Rhodes by Suleiman the Magnificent when they moved to Malta, thus becoming what would later be the Knights of Malta. Oh. As for the Knights Templar, they really never found a home. They had plenty of land in Europe, but no one state home, um, the Teutonic Knights will have their own state, and so will the Knights of Malta. Knights Templar, not so much, and as uh, like we can't go into their history now, but eventually they get destroyed completely by the King of France. 
But getting back to Frederick II and in, uh, in the Holy Roman Empire, uh, as I mentioned, it was in 1226 that Frederick II issued what was called the Golden Bull of Rimini. This bull gave the Teutonic Knights the permission to crusade in the area that we now today call Prussia, um, but it also um, gave them the permission to form their own state there. It formed a literal monastic state. That is a state run by monks. A, uh, yeah, a monastic state. That's what they call it. As a matter of fact, in German they called it the Ordenstaat. Sometimes we call it the Teutonic state. That is, this wasn't only an area of operation. It was literally a state that belonged to the Teutonic Knights. It was confirmed, by the way, by the Pope in 1230. Uh, 1230 um, the Pope also confirmed this uh, as a way to commute the Teutonic Knights' vow since they couldn't work in the Holy Land anymore. Um, be, now, as uh, since this was a favor for the Holy Roman Empire, um, Frederick also gave the Teutonic Knights the permission to use the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire's imperial eagle in their new standard. So now their standard was the shield with the black cross on a white field with the Roman imperial, the Holy Roman Empire imperial eagle in the center. And uh, again, this uh, seal is the seal of, an, of the master general of the order. He was an abbot, so he's got the abbatial uh, mitre, but then also a crozier to signify spiritual power, but also a sword to signify their deputation to fighting for Christian, Christendom. Um, I should also mention that Frederick II was the first one to put two heads on his own imperial eagle, which will become a symbol now of the Holy Roman Empire. He put two heads on it because the head symbolized the power of the state and the power of the church. It was a way of Frederick II trying to make the point, like the Byzantine emperors of old, who also used a two-headed eagle, that they ran both church and state. He was trying to basically snub the Pope by putting two heads on the eagle, but now it will stick. It becomes a symbol of... Um, the Holy Roman Empire and the Austrian Habsburgs later. Um, now, the uh, this state, um, as you can see, you can see it right here. This Teutonic state, um, its capital was Malbork or Marienburg. Here's a picture of their castle, the castle they built there. The Teutonic Knights were known for their state-of-the-art castles. They were very good at building castles. Um, this was their castle at Malbork. And from there, they began fighting. They began fighting against the old Prussians, against the Lithuanians, and against the Livonians, trying to win back, basically, to uh, win these people over Christianity. It wasn't very successful at first in terms of conversions, but they did conquer new land. Eventually, they also merged with another uh, military order, the Livonian, the Livonian Sword Brethren. They also had the commission to basically try to um, conquer the Livonians. They failed. They didn't do a very good job. So eventually, they were merged with the Teutonic Knights. So not only this was part of the Teutonic State, but eventually all this will be joined with the Teutonic State when the Livonian Sword Brethren, whose seal is right here, will join with the Teutonic State. From their new base given to them by Frederick II, the Teutonic Knights immediately began doing battle with the forces of paganism, the old Prussians, the Livonians, and the Lithuanians. Um, they became quite the elite fighting force. It was almost as if the cold environment of the north really brought the best out of them, unlike the desert environment of the Holy Land. Um, from their new base, they immediately began spreading all over the area around Prussia and further. So, for example, you can see right here their basic progress, uh, moving up north, eventually connecting with the Livonian Sword Brethren up here, and forming one large... Um, Teutonic state that not only involved Prussia, but also the area of modern-day Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, however, as you can also see, all these little red dots represent rebellions. They were um, quite resisted. No one seemed to like them. Conversions were slow. Um, so one thing that they did was they kept asking for Germans from the Holy Roman Empire to come and go ahead and live in the Teutonic state. It was basically an open, uh, an open invitation for German nobles for example, think of second sons who want a new place to go for Germans to come and live, German speakers to come and live in the Teutonic state. And that's part of the reason you have a Germanophonic er uh, population in this area. Um, but again, as I said, they're quite opposed by especially the Lithuanians. The Lithuanians don't really like them. The Polish don't like them. The Polish are Christian, but the Polish find them very uh, annoying. Um, 
and also the uh, Livoni, well, sorry, uh, the Livonians, yeah, some of the Livonians, the, the, and also the Russians. There's a lot of people that don't really like the presence of the Teutonic Knights. However, they would all have to unite forces soon because a worse danger was coming. For starting in the 1230s AD, the Mongol hordes arrived in Europe. Um, just an explanation before I color it in. Uh, here you have the Teutonic Knights, these two number fours here. The Russian principalities, remember, they color it one color, but it's principalities. These are the various Russian principalities. Um, Kiev is over here somewhere. Novgorod is up there somewhere. Moscow is over there somewhere. Um, basically, the Mongols suddenly came on, and they came on hard, and they came on strong. Um, they just completely came, uh, they comp came out of the east and invaded Hungary first, and as I mentioned before, they wiped out 40% of its population. They subjected all the Russian principalities to their yoke and um, made many incursions into the area of the Teutonic Knights and Poland. Because of this, in the year, um, well, what was their secret? Let's talk about their secret first. Um, there were a Far Eastern people who had been united by a genius named Temujin in the late 12th and early 13th century. He was thus known, because of what he did, as Genghis Khan, the universal ruler. Genghis Khan and his sons ex uh, after him quickly expanded the Mongol um, Empire to become the largest contiguous empire in world history. They did this by using lightning-fast cavalry, a majority of archers, as you can see right here, some archers, here's their lightning-fast cavalry in a modern movie's depiction. Um, Plenty of siege weaponry, you can see that right here, siege weaponry, and also a tactic of terror wherever they went. They also, by the way, used silk shirts that uh, arrows would pierce, but it was easy to take the arrows back out again, which is one of the worst part about arrows, is the barb of the arrowhead afterwards pulling out of your skin. They just pulled on the, uh, they would just pull on the silk and it would remove the arrow. They also lived in yurts, just have to mention that, because I like yurts. Um, their empire stretched all the way from Hungary and Poland to the Pacific Ocean. Um, the, uh, now, in the year 1241, they were such a threat that the Poles and the Teutonic Knights forgot their old uh, enmity and united against the Mongols. You can see that here in this image. Here you have the Mongol hordes right here, and here you have a, a coalition of Poles and Teutonic Knights. You can see the Teutonic Knights' eagle right here. Um, and they tried to unite forces. It would be the only time, really, that the Teutonic Knights would uh, be well appreciated by the Poles and the Russians and Lithuanians. You can see some other coats of arms here of various Polish uh, families. Unfortunately, the coalition failed. In 1241, uh, they lost that battle. Things were looking bad for Christendom. Oh, here's another image, another artist conception, again, of the Mongols fighting the Teutonic Knights. Um, things looked bad, but then in the year... 1242, um, the current Mongol Khan, Ogade Khan, as I mentioned before when we talk about Russia, um, Ogade Khan died, and when he died, the Mongols basically all left. They still kept Russia, but Europe, they were gone. The Mongols left, and they really never invaded Europe again. Um, so really, it was just a stroke of luck. Who knows what would have happened if the Khan didn't die that year? Um, they never invaded Europe again. So for now, the uh, Mongol threat was over. Unfortunately, what that means is, as soon as the Mongols are out of the way, the Teutonic Knights fall back into enmity with all their neighboring countries. For example, in that very same year, they tried to expand into Russian territory, particularly the Principality of Novgorod. Um, the Russians would not have this, however. So, a person I've mentioned before, Alexander Nevsky, one of the heroes of... Uh, Russian nationalism, this is him right here, Alexander Nevsky, the Prince of Novgorod, um, who was, by the way, the one who decided to um, cooperate with the Mongol hordes. He decided to basically make enemies of the West and make friends with the East. So Alexander Nevsky um, basically, uh, just give me a second, Nevsky basically uh, paid off the Mongols, but when it comes to the Teutonic Knights, he went to war. He attacked the Teutonic Knights to get them to stop expanding uh, eastward. Um, he attacked the Knights at the Battle of, and I'll show it right here, just give me a second, let's move him down. 
the battle of this lake right here, this really large lake that's on the border of the Teutonic Order in Russia, the Battle of Lake Pepis. You can see it right here. Just give me one second. The Battle of Lake Pepis, um, sometimes also called the Battle on the Ice because it was fought literally on the frozen Lake Pepis. In this battle, um, the Russians won. Just give me one second here. The Battle of Lake Pepis. Also in 1242, the Russians won, and basically what this meant was the Russians uh, stopped the advance of the Teutonic Knights. It stopped the eastward expansion of the Teutonic Knights. So from now, there's not going to be any more troubles with Russia. Um, the Teutonic Knights are going to stop that direction. But there are two other countries who are highly annoyed by the presence of the Teutonic Knights, and that is, of course, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Kingdom of Poland. Um, Poland is Christian, but Lithuania is still pagan. Uh, that is, at least until the year 1386. For in the year 1386, uh, Duke Jagiello of Lithuania decides that he's sick and tired of the Teutonic Knights, so he decides he's just going to become Christian. Um, how is he going to do that? By marrying, or in, in uh, concomitance with marrying, um, into a, country, a surrounding country, also to increase his power against the Teutonic Knights. So he has to make a decision. Shall he marry someone from Muscovy, or from Novgorod, in other words, a Russian princess, or shall he marry someone from Poland? ultimately decides to marry someone from Poland, and that's mainly because, remember, the Russians are Orthodox. The Teutonic Order is Catholic. Um, if Jagiello marries into Russia, he'll become Orthodox, and the Teutonic Order will still be on his case. But if he marries um, into Poland, Poland is Catholic, then theoretically the Teutonic Order will literally lose its reason for attacking him. Um, there's supposed to be the idea that the Teutonic Knights are not allowed to attack fellow Catholics. So basically, Jagiela decides to marry into Poland. He was very lucky, because right now, the king of Poland, yes, she's called the king, is King Jadwiga. He marries um, King Jadwiga of Poland. In Poland, um, there's a tradition of calling female regnants uh, uh, kings, even though they're, uh, you know, they're obviously women. We would call them a queen. But he marries King Jadwiga of Poland, and that is how Poland and Lithuania unite into one kind of mega country. Um, it becomes now, we just call it Poland and Lithuania, but now they're united in personal union. The descendants of these two will become the Jagiellonian dynasty, and uh, it just basically means now that these two are one big country. We'll color it in now. Um, this is now uh, the single country of Poland-Lithuania, which should be plenty of clout against the Teutonic Knights. It's now Poland... Just give me a second. There we go. Poland-Lithuania. Once Poland and Lithuania are united, they join forces against the Teutonic Knights. Basically, there's now a lot of aggression that they all take out on the Teutonic Knights, mainly for territory. There's a lot of territorial claims. Um, they have a huge um, victory in the year 1410. The year 1410 is one of the most important battles in Polish and Teutonic Knight history. The Battle of Grunwald, or sometimes called the First Battle of Tannenberg. Um, in this battle, it was actually the largest battle in the Middle Ages, about 40,000 on each side. Well, that's not true. 40,000 on the Polish or Lithuanian side, not exactly as many on the Teutonic side. You'll notice that the forces are so many. On the Polish side, you can tell the side's Polish because the Polish symbol is a white eagle in a red background. Here's Lithuania. Lithuania is a horseman um, on a red background. But you can also see, uh, for instance, this is, um, I believe, Moravia right here. Um, you see various other allies, but even some Mongols. Some Mongols joined the forces with the Lithuanians um, and helped beat back the Teutonic Knights. You can see the Teutonic Knights over here. You see the uh, Imperial Standard over here. Um, and they, they won this battle. They totally won this battle. It was a complete victory um, over the Teutonic Knights. 
um, which is really the first major time that the Teutonic Knights uh, lose. They're kind of an elite fighting force, uh, besides against the Mongols, of course, but it's a major victory for, um, Poli for Poland, Lithuania. From this point on, it's basically a downward spiral. spiral. There's just basically the decline of the Teutonic Knights' power. This demise of the knights can be seen on this particular map. Um, if you look right here, the battle itself was right here, 1410, the Battle of Grunwald. And once it started, um, the Polish were not only able to keep fighting against the Teutonic Knights along with the Lithuanians, but there were also all kinds of rebellions from within the Teutonic Order. Again, these red dots represent rebellions. Basically, the fighting continued um, even up until the year 1466. In 1466, there ended, the fighting basically ended with what's called the Second Piece of Thorn, um, 1466. And in that Second Piece of Thorn, the Polish basically won a whole portion of territory from the Teutonic Knights. You can see that territory right here. It's part of Prussia. Remember, the region of Prussia is all this. Um, but So they had to make a division. They named one part Royal Prussia because it belonged to the Kingdom of Poland. So right here, you have what's called Royal Prussia. Also sometimes called Western Prussia. Later in World War II, it'll be called the Polish Corridor. Um, it's uh, that part where Danzig or Gdansk is, but it belongs to Poland. The Teutonic Knights retained what's called Eastern Prussia, um, or it's still called the Teutonic State. Um, but uh, that's gonna, that basically causes problems mainly because you'll notice now that the Teutonic Knights are separated from the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire is way over here, and here's Eastern Prussia way over here. But in between there is Royal Prussia, which belongs to Poland. And that's going to be a bone of contention for Frederick the Great later, Frederick II. Um, you'll also notice that Marienburg was taken and given to Poland. Marienburg's right here, the old capital. So the Teutonic Knights had to move their capital to Königsberg, which is modern-day Kaliningrad. Remember, this belongs to Russia now. This is that part of Russia that's outside of the rest of Russia, so it's Kaliningrad, but back then it was called Königsberg. Um, here's Königsberg Castle right here, a city that's also famous because... Uh, it's the city of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher Immanuel Kant. If any of you know anything about Kant, it's the city that he never left his whole life. Kant uh, lived in Königsberg his whole life and made his whole philosophy without ever having left the city of Königsberg. But now it's the, ca the capital of the Teutonic Knights. The next major event in Prussian history uh, is the Lutheran Reformation. Here you have Martin Luther um, burning Exerge Domine in 1521. Four years later... You, as we mentioned before, the last Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights, um, Albert of Prussia, this guy right here, he's a Teutonic Knight, um, converted to Lutheranism. Now, once he converted to Lutheranism in 1525, that was the year um, 1525, um, Albert converts to Lutheranism. That secularized the Teutonic state. He turned his own Teutonic state, by the way, there's Royal Prussia again. He turned his own Teutonic state into a Lutheran duchy um, that was hereditary. So uh, he basically, here's, you can watch it right here, just watch the Teutonic order. Um, just give me a second here. There's Teutonic order, but watch what basically happens. There, it turns into now the duchy of Prussia. And Albert the Prussia is its first duke. He becomes the first duke of Prussia. Now, the reason this is a big deal is because now the Duchy of Prussia as firmly belongs to his family. And guess what? His family is the Hohenzollern. He is a Hohenzollern. The family that already has, ever since the Council of Constance, the Electorate of Brandenburg. You can see that right here. So now the Electorate of Brandenburg and the Duchy of Prussia belong to the same family, although two different members of that family. As a matter of fact, if you recall, um, the Hohenzollerns are extremely powerful at this time. Two of his uh, relatives, two of his cousins, who are brothers to each other, are uh, two of the seven electors that elected Charles V. Um, here is his, um, the elector of Brandenburg right here. I also can't remember his name, but they're cousins. Um, but also, 
Albrecht of Mainz, the guy that Luther addressed the 95 Theses to, who was also Archbishop of Magdeburg, who was also Archbishop of oh, one other place, I can't remember what, Halberstadt, I think. Um, so Mainz, Halberstadt, and Brandenburg, clerical pluralist. Um, all three of these guys are Hohenzollerns. So the Hohenzollerns have the electorate of Mainz, the Hohenzollerns have the electorate of Brandenburg, and the Hohenzollerns have um, Prussia. The family's getting very powerful all of a sudden. But of course, the power of the Hohenzollerns is right now divided. Here are the three cousins, Albert, um, Albert of Mainz, um, Joachim I Nestor, and Albert of Prussia. Um, Albert, the Prussian branch is basically over here, and the Brandenburg branch is over here. If we zoom in out a little bit, you can see its origins back with Frederick I Hohenzollern, who became the first Hohenzollern to be the uh, elector of uh, Brandenburg. Um, Brandenburg branch is this way, the Prussian branch is this way. The Prussian branch, just by chance, the fact that the last Teutonic Knight happened to be on Zolern was just very lucky. Normally, of course, this wouldn't be hereditary, but now that he's Lutheran, it's hereditary, so they're passing it down. But likewise, they pass it down over here. A couple notable Brandenburgians. Um, for one, uh, just as Albert I became Lutheran, so in the year 1555, Joachim II Hector became Lutheran. In 1555, both branches by that point were Lutheran. If you remember, that's actually a significant date. Um, that's the Peace of Augsburg. Basically, once it was safe to declare yourself Lutheran in the Holy Roman Empire, the Brandenburg also became Lutheran. Then if you follow down a little bit further, um, eventually the two houses merge. Um, Albert of Prussia's son was a half-wit. He couldn't really rule on his own. So instead, uh, he was uh, his, um, I guess, uh, second cousin or third cousin, we don't know quite what it is, but his relative from Brandenburg ruled as his regent. Um, but then when he died, um, this regent, John Sigismund the Elector, married his uh, Albert Frederick's uh, daughter, Anna, Duchess of Prussia. Um, they married, and in that way, in 1594, there it is, there's the marriage right there. In that way, they united the two houses. Brandenburg and Prussia were now united into one um, personal union, another personal union, uh, the, the Union of Brandenburg Prussia. Another thing we have to mention about John Sigismund is that he also surprised everybody by becoming Calvinist. He became Calvinist. So now um, you kind of have kind of a family feud going on because Prussia is going to remain, the Prussian part uh, with Anna is going to remain Lutheran, but the Brandenburg part is Calvinist. And traditionally now, the electors of Brandenburg are going to be Calvinist. And now we can see the image on a map. Now you see that. Uh, Brandenburg and Prussia are in the same color because it's now one personal union uh, that unfortunately has a huge chunk of Poland in between.